Thank you so much for joining our webinar. The simple meaning of the word tshuva, repentance, means sorry, I'm sorry to Hashem for what I did wrong. But on a deeper level, on a more mystical level, on a more Kabbalistic level, each and every one of us has a soul. That soul is a part of God. When we sin, we schlep God with us into that sin. So what is tshuva on a Kabbalistic level? It's toshuv hay, returning the hay, returning the part of God that's within us, that we've schlepped into the sin, returning that part of God to Hashem. Tshuva on a Kabbalistic level is phenomenal to understand. There is nobody better to take us on this journey as we approach the month of Elul than my good friend Rabbi Nissen David Dubov. Rabbi Dubov, thank you for doing this every week. and we, we, we so look forward to hearing what you have to say on Tshuva. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Nissen. It's lovely to be with you again. I think last week I was in Wales uh, and I told everybody the famous parable about Hamelech Basado is literally out there um, in the um, uh, in the uh, countryside and was greeting the king in the field. We spoke last week about the idea of a king who goes out of his palace and he's on a journey and on the way back he returns through the fields and all the people could go out and greet the king and could <clears throat> in a most cordial and jovial way approach the king. The king was smiling to each person and so on and so forth and that was the content of the shir last week of how during the month of Elul is shining the 13 attributes of mercy. And this is the concept of the king in the field. I just wanted to start this week with a beautiful story, which in fact illustrates this point. I heard an amazing story. Um, there was a rabbi called Rabbi Tuvi Abais. He was the head of the Eida HaKaredis in Yerushalayim one of the great rabbinic courts in Jerusalem. Previously, before that, he was the chief dayan in Antwerp. And in fact, he originated from London, but that wasn't where he was originally from. He was one of the kinder transports, which as you know, in 1939, 10,000 children were saved from the horrors of the Holocaust through the efforts of <clears throat> many who brought them, these 10,000 children to London, most of them, unfortunately, without their parents. So I heard an amazing story about Rabbi Tuvi Weiss. I just want to share it with you as an intro to uh, this evening's uh, Shia. <clears throat> he was in a school initially. I think all the children were, were thereafter farmed out to various families, but they were originally taken to a school. And there were hundreds of kids from the kin kinder transport there. And they heard that one day the king, King George V, would be visiting them to inspect them and see the children that he had saved from the horrors of the Nazi war machine. And of course, the children were told to dress in their finery, and they were lined up on two sides of this uh, school road. And the king drove in his carriage between them and was looking at the children from both sides. And Rabbi Weiss said, that he was standing there as a child, and there was another child next to him who, as soon as the carriage of the king passed by, this kid ran from where he was, jumped on the carriage of the king, and said that he wanted to speak to the king. Of course, the security people there tried to pull him away, but the king said, let him come on. What does this child want? And the child addressed the king, and he said, your majesty, I want to thank you immensely for saving my life and for the life of all these children. What benevolence, what kindness. But how can my happiness be complete when I know that my parents are still there in the abyss of horror? And the king asked for the child's name. He made note of it. And then the child left the carriage. And everybody was thinking what a chutzpah it was for this kid to do such a thing. Of course, nothing else was mentioned, but all the children thought there's something going to happen. Two weeks later, the head teacher of the school calls out this child, and all the kids thought, okay, here it comes. The child was called to the school office, and lo and behold, standing in the school office were the parents of this child. King George V had taken a personal interest and he, using diplomatic measures, 
was able to extract the parents of this boy and to bring them to safety in the United Kingdom. Rabbi Weiss finishes the story by saying, I wish, he said, that I would have had the same chutzpah that this boy had. Because if I had done so, perhaps my parents would also have been alive today. Both his parents perished in the Holocaust. And so what an amazing story about the king being in the field. You know, they say about certain people, he never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. When you have an opportunity, the king is in the field. This coming Thursday and Friday, it's Rosh Chodesh Elo. It's the first of the month of Elo. This is the month of preparation for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's the month we make a soul account. The season of Teshuvah is beginning. Don't miss the opportunity. The king's in the field. You jump on the carriage. Thank you, Rabbi Masinta, for your introduction of this journey of Teshuvah. Please join me tonight. I'm going to go at a steady pace this evening because I have a lot to say in a short amount of time. And so please forgive me if I move rapidly through the content. There is a verse in Shirashir, the Song of Songs, the love story, the allegory between God and the Jewish people, between husband and wife, between body and soul. The verse says, Ani l'doidi v'doidi li. I am for my beloved, my beloved is for me. The Arizal pointed out the first letters of those words, Aleph, Ani, l'doidi, lamed, v'doidi, vav, li, lamed, read out Elul. A lot of people know that, but not a lot of people know the next two words in the verse. The next two words in the verse there are Horoya Basheshan, who grazes his sheep amongst the roses. What has that, the end of the verse, got to do with Anil Adoidi Vadoidi Libra the month of Elo? A Shoshana, a rose, has 13 petals. These 13 petals Kabbalistically represent the 13 attributes of mercy. Ani l'doidi v'doidi li, I am for my beloved, my beloved is for me, because what galvanizes this reciprocal relationship is being pastured and grazed in the roses, in the 13 attributes of mercy in the month of Elul. Where are these 13 attributes of mercy mentioned? Twice. Once in the parsha of Kitisa, where Moshe is asking and supplicating on behalf of his people who have gone astray and served the golden calf. And he's begging God for forgiveness. And God says, I'm going to forgive them, but if you need in future, to arouse this forgiveness, then say these 13 attributes, Hashem, Hashem, Kael, Rachum, Bechanon, Erech, Apayim, Rav Chesed, you're familiar with them, we say them on Yom Kippur. We actually, in many texts of prayers, we actually say them every day in Tachanon. But certainly, everybody is familiar with them because we say them on Yom Kippur. But there's a second time which they're mentioned, which is not so familiar. And that is in the book of Micha, which is in the Tanakh. And there, they're stated somewhat differently. However, they correlate with the 13 attributes mentioned in the parsha of Kitisa. We're actually familiar with them because on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, in fact, this year, it'll be the second day of Rosh Hashanah because the first day is on Shabbos, <clears throat> we say Tashlich, we go out to a pool of water where there's fish, and we cast away our sins into the water, and we enunciate the 13 attributes of mercy. What is the difference between these 13 attributes mentioned in the parasha of Kitisa 
and the 13 attributes mentioned in the book of Micha. And how do these 13 attributes express themselves in the month of Elul? It's the season of Teshuvah. Rabbi Masinta mentioned beforehand, what does Teshuvah mean? Well, simply, in its most simple stance is, stop, don't do it again. The Alter Rebbe in Tanya succinctly says it, Azivas hachet bulvad, just don't do it again. Halachically, Teshuva is a cake of three ingredients. Charata, we regret what we did. Vidui, we verbally enunciate what we did, either through the organized Asham Lubogadna, which is organized according to the Alephet, or the Alchet, also according to the Alephet, which we're familiar with in the prayers of Yom Kippur. And the third ingredient is Kabbalah al a resolve not to go there again, not to repeat it again. As was mentioned, Teshuvah, says the Zohar, has deeper elements. Toshuv, hey, the returning of the hey. There are two hey's in God's name, Yud, hey, Vav, and a final hey. So there's the return of the lower hey, and there's the return of the upper hey. There's the return of the lower hey, which is the return of the Shekhinah, because the skin of the divine presence is in exile, and we need to re-spiritualize ourselves and the world by bringing the hay, the fractured hay of the name, back together so that the name is complete. And then there is the return of the upper hay, representing the sephira of Bina, which means that our minds need to be permeated and infused with Torah learning. But tonight I'm going to speak about a verse which encapsulates the content and the message which I'd like to give over this evening. There is a pasuk that says, V'haruach toshuv el ho'eloikim asher nesona. The spirit will return to the God who gave it. Now generally we take this and we understand this as the idea of passing, of dying, that the body goes back to the earth from whence it came, it what came from the earth and it goes back to the earth, and the spirit will go back to God. However, the concept of teshuva is not just repentance, but it actually means return, returning to its pristine essence, returning to that vantage point from where it came, not by dying, but by being within and yet having a higher perspective. Have they call Yom of Teshuvah? A person should spend all their days doing Teshuvah. Teshuvah is not only when one sins, but if good is good, better is not better. Teshuvah is about improvement. It's about growth. It is about the depth and the breadth of the soul. It's about seizing the opportunity of every moment, every day, every month, every year. There's a beautiful Zohar. The Zohar says, Chosar Yuma Chada, Chosar Levusha Chada. If you're missing one day, you're missing one garment. Avraham and Sarah, zikenim boim bayomim. Abraham and Sarah were elderly, but they came with all their days. What does that mean? When they passed away, they were able to show how they utilized every single day to the full in the service of God. By the way, that's a new and beautiful twist on the word arichus yamin. We wish people, I wish you a long life. It doesn't just mean that we should live till 100 years old, 120 years old. But what it actually means is that each day should be long. Each day should be full. Each day should be complete. 
And if you miss one day, you're missing one garment. It's only in this world that we have the opportunity to do teshuva. In fact, the Talmud says, Ha'oisa teshuva miyira, somebody who does teshuva out of awe, out of fear, zadoinais, those sins which they did on purpose, nasim lo kashkogos, will be made like inadvertent sins. Ha'oisa teshuva miyahava, but somebody who does teshuva out of love, zadoinis nasa lo kazochias, then the sins which they did on purpose will be transformed into merits. Just imagine for a minute, a person could have done the worst things, but yet if they are used as the springboard from which they are catapulted into a moment of teshuva, then in one single moment, a person can change from one extreme to the other extreme. And this can only be done in this world and not in the next. How come? There are two verses which I'd like to explain to you. There is a pasuk which says, es es ani mole. The heavens and the earth I fill, says God. And yet in another verse it says, mole kol ha'oretz kavoidoi that the whole world, the whole of the earth, is filled with God's glory. So one may ask, how come in the first verse it says, both the heavens and the earth, I fill, the reference is to I, me, God, and in the second verse it says that the earth, and it doesn't mention the heavens, is full of kavoidoi, my glory. The Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi, the founder of Chabad in Lukut Torah, explains the following. He says that when it says, it refers to a level of godliness called Soivid Kolamin. The Zoyhar says there are two levels of godliness. One is the level of godliness which infuses the worlds, which fills the worlds. And that is called memale. And then there's a level of godliness called stoivev kolalmin, which is encompassing, which is peripheral to the worlds. Now, that level doesn't mean that it's around the worlds. In other words, that it's not actually filling them. But as the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, what it means is that, it, of course, it fills the space of the worlds, but it's much higher than them. So the Alter Rebbe explains like this. Mole kol ha'oretz, the earth is full of kavod. Kavod means glory. It's a ray, a fraction of God's infinity. A fraction and a ray of that infinity is revealed in the earth. However, there's a level which is much higher than that. And that's called soviv kol the Alter Rebbe explains the difference between the two as the difference between food and clothing. What is the difference? Food is ingested. Food comes within and is transformed into flesh and blood. Clothing, on the other hand, is not internal, it is external. Kabbalistically, food is compared to the level of godliness, which is called memalikolami, which fills the worlds. It's taken and it's given over to each level of the body, whereas clothing is just peripheral to the body. In fact, we can correlate these two levels with Torah and mitzvahs. Torah says the Zohar, oiraiso mechachma nafkas. Oiraisa, which means Torah in Aramaic, Oriesa literally means it brings light, it illuminates. That comes forth from the first sphere called Chachma. Chachma itself has Lamed based Nasibas Chachma, has 32 pathways of Chachma that go out of Chachma. What is a path? A path is something that joins one place with the other place. 
Similarly, Chochma comes down into the world. Wisdom comes down into the world. And as it diffuses throughout the worlds, the wisdom of Torah can be perceived in the higher garden of Eden, which is in the world of Bria, in the lower garden of Eden, which is in the world of Yetzira. And as it comes enclosed in the physical realm, it comes enclosed in the physical aspects of this world as we learn Torah in this world. It's like a waterfall which cascades down from the highest to the lowest elements. This is Torah. This is the level which is called Memali Kolam, and it fills all the worlds. That's compared to food. However, and there is the level of mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are called are from the level which we call soiviv kolamin, which is peripheral to the worlds. And this is like garments. In other words, when a person keeps a mitzvah, they're drawing down and they're connecting to a level of godliness, which in fact far transcends anything that can come down into the, into the worlds. By the way, <clears throat> we mentioned beforehand that the Garden of Eden, the higher Garden of Eden, the lower Garden of Eden, this is where souls, after their sojourn in this world, go to. And in fact, in those levels, a person learns Torah, and the same Torah that a person's learned over here in this world they will relearn in that world on the level of wisdom as it is in that world. That is a tremendous reward for the soul because what is perceived down here is understood on a higher level up there. That is why there are multiple academies in the world to come, in those higher worlds. And in fact, a person is let into an academy in which they studied in this world. Whatever they studied in this world, that is what they're let into over there. <clears throat> the Gemara says, called Sadiv Sadik Shal In that world, each righteous person gets singed by the chupa, by the canopy of the other. Because in that world, we will be able to fully understand the opportunity of this world. And we will kick ourselves if we missed the opportunity of delving and learning in this world. There's a terrible expression of killing time. It's a most terrible thing because time itself is one of the greatest gifts. And when a person utilizes that time for Torah and for mitzvahs, it will become absolutely apparent in the world to come <clears throat> the difference between a person who did, let's say, 100 mitzvahs and 101 mitzvahs. The difference between them will be massive and it will be very clearly seen in that world. There it's a world of truth. Here it's a world of facade, of shekel, of falsehood. Now, the good news is that we're here now in the marketplace. We can buy and sell. There, whatever you come with, that's what you have. In fact, you can't change your status in that world. The only thing that can be done to you in that world is if over there, they, if you want, cleanse you. They uh, cleanse you of the uh, quagmire of this world. The correct word is the chezu de hai alma, of how the, if you want the outlook of this world, of how it looks. And sometimes there are various cleansing agents which are mentioned in the books, in the Sfarim, such as Kaf HaKela. Kaf HaKela is a horrible state in which the soul is slingshot between a spiritual status and this world, and the actual soul oscillates between the two. And it's a very unsettling feeling because on one hand, the soul thinks it's actually living back in this world when it's actually not. And then it doesn't comprehend and it can't get into a higher place in Gan Eden. That is a terrible pain for the soul. 
There is chibut hakever, what goes on in the grave. And there's gehinom, there is gehenom, there is hell, which is expressed by fire, the fires of gehenom. But in a simple sense, and as we've explained it over here, the inability to get in to a place that you really want to get into, because then you perceive how great it is and how wonderful it is if you're on the outside and locked out. It's a terrible shame and it is a terrible pain. And so here in this world, you can buy and sell. Over there, whatever you come with, you come with. There are in fact ways of how to elevate souls even in that world as we do by Yizkor, we give Tzedakah, what's the whole idea? The whole idea is that those souls can no longer elevate themselves by doing mitzvahs, but we can do mitzvahs in their merit. We can say Kaddish in their merit and so on and so forth. Yes, there are many things that we can do in this world for them, but they can't do for themselves. And yet in this world, this is an amazing world. You know why? Because what you can do in this world is learn. You can get within this world the wisdom and the knowledge that you'll take with you to the next world. And you can do mitzvahs. You can draw down from the light of sovev in this world. And that light of sovev has the power, has such tremendous power within it that it links you with something which is completely transcendent of this world. What happens if a person hitherto has mocked up, has messed up, has missed the opportunity? There's a tremendous gift called Teshuvah. And we're just starting the season of Teshuvah. Teshuvah is not about God punishing us. It's not about the ogre in heaven who's going to club us if we don't listen. The greatest Yom Tov in the Jewish calendar is Yom Kippur because it's the greatest gift. God gave us on Yom Kippur the second set of tablets. The, Moses was on the mountain three times for 40 days. The first time he received the first set of tablets, which unfortunately was smashed. The second time he was on the mountain for 40 days, he appeased God. But the third time, when he went up on Rosh Chodesh Elul, he stayed there for 40 days until Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, God atoned the sin of Jewish people, and he gave them the second set of tablets. What was the difference between the first set and the second set of tablets? The first set of tablets were given to the Jews, when they were tzaddikim, they were righteous. They hadn't yet sinned by the golden cart. The second set of tablets were given to the Jews when they were on the level of Baalei Teshuvah, when they had become owners of Teshuvah, when they had engaged in this Baharuach Toshuvah, they were returning their spirits to God, not in a form of death, but it's in a living form of death, in the sense of being detached from the temporary, of being detached from the van vanity of this world and attaching to the eternal whilst they are here. That's the second set of tablets. That's why it was given in Yom Kippur and that's why we look forward to Yom Kippur. Yet it's, it's hard to fast for 24 hours, but that fasting creates us a form of an angelic state where we can look at our bodies and we can hmm, and we can ponder and we can think about the temporal state of the body and its affairs. And yet, that's specifically the moment that we can engage in this teshuvah, that we can come out of Yom Kippur cleansed from within. Every day we daven. God return us with a complete teshuva before you. What happens if a person has messed up? All the infusion, all the drawing down of godliness that could have been done, wasn't done. All the days, all the months, all the years of lost opportunities, 
of just looking the other way. You know, the Alter Rebbe gives a fantastic marshal, a fantastic parable of two people standing back to back. Are they close? Yeah, you can't get closer. The only problem is they're looking the opposite way. Says the Alter Rebbe, the whole year round, we often stand back to back to God. But the problem is we're looking the opposite direction. We're so near and yet so far. Teshuvah means turning around. When do we teshuva? On the high holy days. You know, when you're standing back to back with somebody and you don't even know they're there and you turn around, <gasps> you get a shock. They were there, they were right there and you didn't even notice. There's initial shock. Those are the days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But then, when you realize that they're right there, what do you do? You embrace. That's the hug of the sukkah. That's the envelopment of the sukkah and the dance of Simchas Torah. And that's the whole dynamic of the high holy days. First are the days of awe, and then become the days of joy. And with that joy, we dance with the Simcha Shal Mitzvah, with the joy of mitzvah right throughout the whole year because Simcha is a bulldozer. And what can bulldoze away any sadness, any melancholy, any depression, any... <clears throat> I think I, the way I explain it is, it, it, it's like the Yitzhahara, our evil inclination disables us. Teshuva can break through and Simcha creates a path. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, writes about a Jew in Lubavitch who is called Rebbe Yisrael the Freilacher, Rebbe Yisrael the happy one. He used to jump and dance and he, he was the happiest man on earth. He had nothing and he was happy. Why? He used to say the following, Rebbe Yisrael der Gornisht. If Rebbe Yisrael the nothing, can goyrem zayn dem eim sev baruchu anachas ruach can cause the infinite one, blessed be he, joy, zolech nisht, tansen and springen from freid, should I not jump and dance from joy? Think about it. Me, a mere speck in the cosmos, I can cause a joy to God? Whoa! Should I not jump and dance with joy? That's simcha says the Alter Rebbe. Return us with a complete teshuva. Lefanecha. What is lefanecha before you? Says the Alter Rebbe. The root of the word is the word panim, the face. Lipnimiyusacha. Return us to your inner self. In other words, on... Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and in the month of Elo, we ask God to return us into his inner dimension. That, in Kabbalah, in Chassidus, is called Atmos, the very essence of godliness, which transcends the levels of Memale Kol Almin and Soviet Kol Almin, because then you get with Teshuvah to the essence of the matter. And when you have that open soul surgery, and you get down to that core, that pristine essence, and you bring it forth, that has the capability of filling in any dense blemishes, anything that was lacking, anything that was missing. That's Teshuvah. The empowerments for that are the 13 attributes of mercy. And those start shining in the month of Elul. During the month of Elul, these 13 attributes of mercy, the king in the field say to a person, Kinderach, as we said in last week's Sedra in the parish of Re'ei, Boni Matem Lashem Lekechem, you are the children of God. So the father says, Kinderach, children, Come home. We daven 
Hachazirenu b'seshuva shalem alafanach Hashem. You help us, bring us in a full teshuva back to you. What does it mean, a full teshuva? Bring us, as we said, with all the points beforehand. Bring us and help us to stop repeating what we've done. Toshav hey, to infusing ourselves with the Shekhinah, with the Divine Presence. Toshav hey law with the higher hey, fill our minds with Torah. Vaharuach Toshav Elohim Hashem Chait doesn't just mean sin, but it means something which was lacking. If we're lacking in any area, help us return. Help us utilize the moment of this world. The 13 attributes in Parsha of Kitisa, God was about to destroy the Jewish people physically. Moshe entreated. And so God said to him, if there's ever a moment where the body is to be destroyed, say these. In Micha, this is a prayer of the soul itself. Micha says, there are 13 attributes of mercy which the soul itself, even though the soul is a spark of godliness, nevertheless, the soul in this season of teshuva needs what's called chelayatev. In simple English, you'd say, I kick up the... But in the spiritual terms, what it means, it needs empowerment. It needs ease. It needs strength to go out of the comfort zone, even the spiritual comfort zone, in order to lift up and say, this is coming a new year. In four weeks' time, it's going to be Rosh Hashanah. It's going to be a Shana from the word Shinui. Shana comes from the word Shinui, which means the change. We should have a Shana Tova. We should have a good change. Umatuka, it should be sweet and reveal goodness. Who would have thought that last year, Rosh Hashanah, we would ever even have thought about a pandemic? But everything is from the hands of heaven, apart from our reaction. What is ours is our reactions to it. How are we going to take what's happened and react to it positively with more good deeds of kindness, with more Torah learning, with more prayer, with more reaching out to others? We ask Hashem, Hashem, help us do a full teshuva. Help us do a tshuva in the world of mamali, the level of mamali kolam and through Torah learning. Help us do a tshuva in the form of mitzvahs. And most importantly, help us regain the spiritual heights. Help us come to that vantage point of where we can go into this new year on a completely different level than we have experienced in the previous years. Where we can go into this new year, this new rosh, the head of this change can take place. By the way, the head of this coming year is on Shabbos. The first day of Rosh Hashanah is on Shabbos. So it's what's called a Shabbos Dika year. It's a year that begins with Shabbos. The whole concept of Shabbos is menucha, is tranquility, resting from all the engagement within the physical affairs of this world, but focusing on our spiritual accomplishments, challenges, ambitions. What are we going to do? And so the message of today's class is poignant, simple, profound, and powerful. Every day is precious. Every day is a gift. Every day is a garment. Don't come without one of those garments. Every day we elevate different parts of the world. Today, I ate an apple from South Africa. How did it get to London? I don't know, thousands of people involved. Somebody picked it over there. Somebody transported it to London. All that energy ended up in my tummy. And I'm using it now to give a shear. And there's people around us, by Hashkocha Pratis, where we are. It's tailor-made. The people that we come into contact with, each one of us is an ambassador for, from above, a shaliach of Hashem, to be a soul and a candle which will illuminate ourselves 
and our environment, people around us, the world around us, with the light of mitzvah, the light of Torah and <clears throat> the candle of mitzvah. This last week passed away one of the great sages of Israel. And as a tribute to him, I'd like to finish this week's class. He was called Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael, more popularly known as Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, translated the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, into a flowing Ivrit, wrote many, many books on Kabbalah, one of them called The Thirteen Petal Rose, an excellent book. And I had the great opportunity to meet him once, in fact, twice. Uh, I was a student then, and we'd heard, you know, Robert Steinsaltz is a very uh, famous character, and he was a very humble and engaging person when he spoke. I just want to share with you as a tribute to him what he said to us when I was a student. He came in for the yeshiva, and he said, I'll just try and, uh, if I can, imitate his, his, his English, because he was an Israeli born in Yerushalayim. He says, ah, you students, you waste so much time. What a waste of time you are. He says, you need to learn from Arimon. So I was thinking Arimon in Hebrew means a pomegranate. So he says, no, no, no. I don't mean Arimon you eat. I mean Arimon in the Israeli army, Arimon is a hand grenade. A hand grenade, they call them Rimonim in the army. He says, when you pull the pin, he says, at this moment, five seconds means a lot. It's the difference between life and death. When you're holding this hand grenade, he said, if you throw it, you'll live. If you hold on to it, you'll die. Five seconds becomes meaningful when you're holding a hand grenade. And he went on to explain to us of how five seconds are important, five minutes are important, five hours are important in his very beautiful style. Yehei Zichrei Baruch, his memory should be a blessing for us and all of Israel. But I was thinking to myself on Shul, on Shul on Shabbos, you know, today in Shul, I don't know how it is over there, but we're all wearing masks in Shul. And I was thinking to myself, you know, often <clears throat> somebody pulls a pin and then you've got five seconds either to explode the hand grenade to say something, as King Solomon says, the tongue can kill or give life, or to shut your mouth. And wearing the mask teaches us, whoa, be careful of what you're going to say. Five seconds can either kill or give life. Hashem, in this coming month of Elul, when the king's in the field, let's learn from the kid who was standing next to Tuvia Weiss. This yeah. kid took the opportunity to speak for the king in the field, and he saved his parents. Let us not miss the opportunity. Let us approach the king in his smiling countenance in this month of Elul and say to Hashem, Hashem, Ani Lodoidi, I'm going to make the first move this month. I'm going to say to you the following, notwithstanding all my quirky things, all my deficiencies, all my negative character traits, everything that I not necessarily have done right in the past year or years, it could be a huge amount of baggage which I have, guilt which I have, and so on and so forth. Notwithstanding all of that, notwithstanding my own strong gate Sahara inside me, notwithstanding my circumstances, you know what? This coming year is going to be different. I'm not going to make huge, massive quantum leaps. Those often don't stand. 
But in each area of Torah, Avodah, and Gemilot Chasadim, in each area of Torah learning, in each area of service, of prayer, and in the area of doing acts of kindness, I'm going to take on something small but strong. I once heard from my wife, Zosie Zangizunt, a beautiful Pirush, a beautiful explanation. The Talmud says, Open up for me the eye of a needle, and I will open up for you the entrance to the temple. In other words, God says, just do a little bit, and I'll open up for you great vistas. And the question is, why does the Talmud use the eye of a needle to express the idea of something which is small? After all, there's a lot of things which are small. A barley seed is small. A, a, a rice um, is small. Why does it say the eye of a needle? And she said something very profound. The eye of a needle is small, but try and, try and destroy it with your fingers. Not so easy. You'll need a pair of pliers in order to do it. Pischuli kechudosh or machat. Open up for me the eye of a needle because that little thing which you take on has to be as strong as the eye of a needle that nothing can destroy it. You'll need a big pliers to get rid of it. The good decisions that you'll take on in Torah learning, in prayer, and in Gemilas Chasadim, in acts of kindness, in Teshuva, and in getting yourself ready for the Geula, as the Rebbe said, this is the generation when we need to live with Mashiach, when we need to change our whole mindset, and we need to start living in a geula mindset. Whatever you do, take it on, but it should be strong as the eye of a needle. Hashem returns in that complete teshuva before you to your inner self. I wish each of you that we should have the Soch Klal Yisrael amongst all of Israel, a kasiva v'chasim atoiva l'shan atoiva mesuka. We should be written, sealed, and inscribed and sealed for a good, happy, and sweet new year. And most importantly, it should be a healthy new year. And it should be a year in which we'll greet the coming of Mashiach, the Mehera, the Amenu, Amen. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Dubov, one of your dedicated listeners, or participants, WhatsApp me, WhatsApp me to ask the following to you. And he, he's not playing, he's not doing it in jest. He spoke about Molay Kol Haaretz Kabaydei. It could also be read as Molay Kol Haaretz COVID. <laughs> and you would like your insight on that either this week or next week. <laughs> You know, uh, it says, the Talmud makes a comment and says, Ein kovoid ela toira. Kovoid is toira. How is that? What's the gematria of kovoid? Kof is 20, vase is 2, 22, vav is 6, 28, dalad is 4, 32. Because there are 32 pathways of wisdom which stream down from the Sephira of Chachma. So when we talk about Kovoid, we're talking about Torah learning. <clears throat> COVID-19, the number 19 is very, very significant in Kabbalah. Actually, I'll leave that for a different time because it's very deep and very beautiful. But one thing is for sure, <clears throat> COVID-19 has changed the world we live in. It's a seismic change. And this is the type of change that will happen when Mashiach will come. The world, I never thought of a world of COVID. I didn't even, it wasn't in my genre to think of such a world. And yet, one guy in China sneezed and it happened almost overnight. And all of us have been catapulted into an entirely different set of mindset and circumstance and reaction. This is how it will be when Mashiach will come. And I think that what has come out of COVID 
and can be seen very, very clearly, is tremendous community spirit. The community spirit is gewaldic. People caring for each other. Yeah, our minig is always to complain in the Jewish community. That's always been around. But the care has also been terrific. The delivering of meals and the calling of people and the literally the, the tremendous chesed and the outpouring. The reason we went into Golos was because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred. However, now, we're giving each other the correct respect and appreciation by taking care of each other and ensuring this merit, Mashiach will come. Amen. Aaron, over to you.